Welcome to today's webinar titled, Ready and Resilient, Training Skills to Enhance the Personal Readiness of Wounded Warriors, Their Caregivers, and Family Members. We are thrilled to have Dr. Gloria Park with us today. Dr. Gloria Park's background is in both, both in kinesiology with a specialization in exercise, sports psychology, and applied positive psychology. She was a competitive figure skater for over 14 years. For the past six years, she has delivered resiliency training to the United States Army, serving as a master resiliency trainer through the University of Pennsylvania, and is now with the Army Resiliency Directorate, G1. She trains performance and wellness skills to soldiers, family members, and DA civilians. Before we hear from Dr. Park, Colonel Kevin Bingleman, who is the operations and training division chief, Army Resiliency Directorate, would like to say a few words. Uh, thanks, Dan, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Colonel Kevin Bigelman, and on behalf of the Army G1, Lieutenant General McConville, and my boss, Ms. Sharon Saunders, uh, we'd like to thank you for uh, being here for this webinar. I know you'll find it uh, extremely inform informative and uh, valuable and uh, definitely a good use of your time. So in, in the Army Resiliency Directorate, our organization takes care of the Comprehensive Soldier Family Fitness Program, the Army Substance Abuse Program, and the Army Suicide Prevention Program. And we're trying to look at each of those programs, not in a stovepipe manner, but more holistically. And our whole goal is to focus on personal readiness and an optimization of performance in an environment that's conducive to uh, the, the positive factors of, of being a soldier or a family member or a DA civilian. So I think we're going to hear some uh, from, from Dr. Park. We're going to get uh, a couple of great skills. I think the first is on self-care, and the second skill is on uh, strengthening relationships between you, the provider, and those that you care for. If you'd like to get more information on some of the great uh, CSF2 assets that we've got, I think we've got some handouts attached to the, uh, the webinar side piece on the right hand of the screen. Um, and, and you can also find out more about the 20, eventually 26 training centers, CSF2 training centers that we'll have across the Army. So um, again, thank you very much for what you do for our wounded warriors and their families. Your, your job is extremely critical. And uh, thank you again for being here, and, and thanks to Dr. Park for her, her time and uh, expertise. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Dr. Park. All right. Thank you, Colonel Bigaman and Stan, for that introduction. Good afternoon to all of you, and thank you all for taking part in today's teleconference. Uh, we'd also like to say thanks to uh, Warrior Care Command and Military OneSource for allowing us to share some of the work that we do here at CSF2. Um, as part of the critical work that you all are doing as caregivers. Um, as Stan already mentioned, there are uh, some handouts that I will uh, be talking about a little bit later in this presentation that you're welcome to download through the conference app. Uh, the PowerPoint presentation is also available in case you're having trouble. Um, as I go through the slides, I will make sure to let you know when I'll be advancing. And please do submit questions as we go through if you have any, and we'll do our best at the end of the teleconference to get to them. As Colonel Bigelman already introduced, two of the key issues that we're going to be talking about today are around how do you as caregivers provide care for yourselves so that you can be more effective at caring for the, those you've committed yourself to, and how do we also maintain and strengthen the connections between the caregiver and the receiver of the care. We know that um, there are an estimated 5.5 million spouses, siblings, parents, and friends who have put their lives on hold to care for wounded warriors. And as part of the work we do at CSF2, we work with um, soldiers in the Army going through the WTU program to provide them with some skills and uh, performance and well-being um, concepts that they could use in their recovery and transition process. And we know a lot about what some of the challenges and adversity those soldiers face. What we know less about are the challenges and adversities that the caregivers face. Um, I've been doing up some reading on uh, some of those issues. I found a wonderful blog on the Washington Times that referred to caregivers as the hidden heroes. Um, you all 
deal with enough on your own in your lives and you've committed yourself the ultimate um, responsibility of caring for those who are around you uh, to help them through their transition process. And we know that you all also face um, inherent challenges and stressors that are part of that process as well. And part of what we want to talk about today are some practical skills that you can be applied, that can be applied immediately, not only to yourselves, but also those you care for to help enhance that process. So let's dive into the first skill that we're going to talk about. What we're going to start by discussing is energy management. Energy is a crucial component of optimal performance and well-being. And when we teach energy management, whether it be to soldiers who are well, uh, soldiers in the WTU, DA civilians or family members, we often poll the group and ask, how, how effective are you at having the energy that you need for the things that are most important to you? And many people raise their hands and tell us and share with us that they often know that they need to do a better job of managing their energy, but they don't really have a whole lot of tools to be able to do that on their own. So self-awareness is the first step, but also learning and practicing some skills to help you manage energy is really critical. And the ironic part is if you think about daily life, we tend to manage our energy really well with other things. So for example, with the technology that we use to make our lives easier. Um, if you check your iPhone at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and you find that you only have about 30% left on your battery, um, we take action. We take proactive steps to actually figure out how to um, manage that energy to, to get us to the end of the day. So some of those strategies might be reaching out to the person in the next cubicle and asking for their charger or changing some of the settings to dim the lights um, so that you know that you have the energy that you need to get yourself home. We don't, unfortunately, do the same with ourselves. We don't manage our own energy in a way that's proactive and as efficient as we do with our devices. So one of the skills we're going to talk about today is called deliberate breathing, and it's a very uh, user-friendly and practical tool that you can have um, as part of your toolkit to help you better manage your energy so that you do have the attention um, and the uh, peace of mind to be able to do what's most important to you most effectively. So let's start with a working definition. So what is energy management? Energy management, I'm sorry, this is next slide. We're on slide five. Um, the, let's, energy management is a self-regulation process through which an individual does three different things. You're able to mobilize energy to deal with things that come up in your life. You're balancing energy systems so that you are not losing energy when you need to be saving it up. And the last piece of it is recovering energy in preparation so that you have those energy stores at the ready when those demands arise. For the purposes of today, let's focus on the recovery and rejuvenation aspect of energy management. Um, for caregivers, and, and not only for caregivers, but for most of us, we often don't take the time to prioritize rejuvenation. Life happens, um, often we can't. There are many demands on us as um, working professionals, as parents, that we don't tend to prioritize recovery as much as we should. But it is my belief that you can't do the other two parts of energy management, mobilizing and balancing, if you don't have the energy ready to be able to um, deploy when you need it the most. We know that uh, so managing, next slide. We know that managing your energy impacts a myriad of things. So, for example, if you don't properly manage your energy, it's really difficult to have clarity and presence when um, you're thinking about the situations that are around you. It becomes really difficult for us to regulate our emotions, and it becomes really difficult for us to complete the tasks that we have uh, to complete every single day to the best of our abilities. We know that managing our energy also has a huge impact on recovery and healing. As part of the phase two goal setting curricula that we have the Army WTU soldiers go through, it is a, a set of skills that we teach them that are uh, directed to help them with their performance process through the recovery and transition. Um, we talk a lot with them about the impact that managing your energy can have on recovery and healing. And you can see some of those research findings on your screen. Um, mental and emotional states impact healing and recovery. Um, and there are a lot of things that 
can help a soldier's ability to heal and transition. However, stress also impacts you as the caregivers. Um, I'm going to talk really quickly about a research study that Ronald Glazer and Janice Kiko Glazer have conducted looking specifically at stress recovery and healing and impact on the immune system specifically for caregivers. So what this couple have done is conduct some research looking at how the process of caregiving others can impact your own ability to heal and your own immune function. One example of that study is that they took a group of um, both caregivers of Alzheimer's patients who are under enormous and constant amounts of stress, probably very similar to what you all are experiencing in your caregiving roles, and they compared them to a group of folks who were not caregivers. So they're matched for age and socioeconomic status among a couple of other variables, but they're a comparable group of people who perhaps aren't experiencing the same amount of stress and um, challenges. What they did was they wanted to look at the difference between those two different groups and their ability to heal after a wound. So this is an experimental study. They gave all of the participants a small pencil eraser sized wound. And they photographed the wound in both of these groups over time and watched the shrinkage and healing of the wound when they compared it to a standardized dot to see how quickly they were able to uh, recover and heal from that wound. What they found was that the wounds of the caregivers of Alzheimer's patients, so those folks who were under significant amounts of stress, um, dealing with daily challenges, they reported higher levels of stress, obviously, to, when compared with a group of folks who were not caregivers. And on average, the wounds of the non-stressed group, those who were not caring for Alzheimer's patients, healed nine days faster than those of the caregivers. So just by the stress that we are experiencing, it severely impacts our ability to heal after illness, heal after wounds, and that ultimately can impact the way that you are able to care for those around you. So the bottom line is that you as caregivers, you need to be proactive about implementing deliberate and purposeful strategies to manage your energy and stress so that you can be sure you're effectively caring for yourself and in turn better caring for those around you. Now we understand this is better, uh, easier said than done. Um, for many of us, I think, Again, we realize that we may not be managing our energy to the best of our ability, but we just don't have any um, solid, concrete strategies to help us get there. In addition, sometimes life just doesn't allow us to get as much sleep as we want. We have a lot of responsibilities that we're juggling on a day-to-day, -day, and sometimes it makes it really difficult. And the strategy that we're going to talk about today, called deliberate breathing, is a skill that's really portable, um, can be applied in a number of different settings, and really easy to add to your toolkit to manage your energy better. Next slide. Before diving into the skill, let's take a look at the systems in place in our bodies that control our energy. This is probably not new information to all of you. Um, we know that there is a hardwired response that is built into our bodies called the fight or flight system. And what fight or flight enables us to do and enabled our ancestors to do was to address stressors and challenges that we encountered in the environment. So in order for us to effectively deal with those stressors and, and challenges, our body enacts a bunch of different physiological responses to help us deal with that threat in a more effective way. Fight or flight is really adaptive response, and it helps us in a lot of ways. However, when our bodies activate fight or flight, when perhaps the stressor is not real, that it's imagined, or when we're not able to control the intensity at which fight or flight is enacted, we start to waste a lot of energy. So if you think of what our daily lives consist of now, um, it's probably not that we are having to enact fight or flight to deal, to, to fight off a saber-toothed tiger. Um, but our bodies enact fight or flight in a very similar way when, for example, um, someone cuts us off on the highway. So first step in understanding um, your energy reserves is to understand when is it that my fight or flight is activated. On the right-hand side of the screen, you'll see we're going to be talking a little bit about the rest and digest response. 
Stress and digest is an opposite and complementary system to fight or flight. It is the physical state at which the body is marshalling, collecting, and storing energy so that we have it available for us when those demands arise. For many of us, we tend to live much more in fight or flight. Our daily lives um, are riddled with things that we perceive to be as stressors or challenges, um, and for that reason, we need to have some sort of strategy or proactive way to be able to balance out that fight or flight effect so that we have the energy that we need to be able to deal with the things that are most important to us. Here is where our strategy of deliberate breathing comes in. Next slide. The skill we're going to talk about first is called deliberate breathing. And this slide is just to orient you to what we are talking about when we are referring to deliberate breathing. So for some of you, you may be yoga um, practitioners. You may have learned about deliberate breathing in a relaxation um, type of class setting. Um, what we mean by deliberate breathing is breathing very slowly, low and deep, where your core is expanding, you're bringing in that full capacity of breath with every single breath that you take. A key aspect of that is breathing rhythmically. And we're going to do, we're going to practice that as a group over this webinar today um, in counting through a cadence of five that helps bring on the rest and digest response. The other aspect of deliberate breathing and perhaps the advanced level um, application of this is to also think about how we can control our thoughts to produce the physiology and emotional state that we desire in any particular situation. So that's just a quick overview of what we mean by deliberate breathing, and I'm going to walk you through a little bit of practice in just a moment. Next slide. We know that there are a couple of different ways that we can apply deliberate breathing, and for the purposes of this teleconference, we're going to focus on the recovery benefits. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the performance benefits in just a moment. But this is based on work by Herbert Benson. We know that the practice of deliberate breathing and sustained sessions of practice, you know, 15, 20 minutes or more, increases energy efficiency. It helps speed healing by bringing the full capacity of ox oxygen into your body. It helps manage pain, perhaps by taking the um, attention off of where the pain is happening, which often is inside the brain, and focusing on other parts of your physiology that we can control. And for those of you, if you're anything like me and have trouble sleeping, this is a great tool to help reduce insomnia. So um, starting off or perhaps ending your sleep hygiene routine by laying down and engaging in 15 or 20 minutes of deliberate breathing can really help reduce um, instances of insomnia. Um, the performance benefits, we, which we won't talk about much today, um, probably less relevant to a population of caregivers than the recovery benefits. The performance benefits involve taking one or two of these deliberate breaths prior to doing something that is important to you. Um, I took a couple of deliberate breaths before we started off on this teleconference to get myself in the right state of mind. But that is another application of deliberate breathing. And if you all have questions on that, please submit them, and we're happy to address them at the end of the presentation. Next slide. So what does deliberate breathing look like? If you've ever watched a baby sleeping in a crib, you'll probably notice that the child's stomach expands really large out like a very, very big balloon and then almost um, unbelievably shrinks back in and deflates. And that process is repeated, if you watch a baby sleep, throughout their entire sleep period. At some point as adults, I believe that we're socialized to breathe shallow from our chest. So nature intended us, you know, as evidenced by watching children breathe, um, to breathe diaphragmatically, to breathe slow, low, and deep to get that mass of oxygen into our bodies. But as adults, when we are particularly dealing with times of stress um, or trying to just keep up with day-to-day -day life, we start to breathe much more shallow from our chest. So the first thing we're going to do Wherever it is that you are, whether you're in a conference room or if you're in an office or if you're sitting at your cubicle, get in a comfortable position and we're going to just do a really quick self-awareness check. So put your right hand on your chest and your left hand on your stomach. And just for a couple of seconds, breathe the way that you normally would. And as you're breathing, 
Pay close attention to whether the hand on your chest is moving more or whether the hand on your belly is moving more. So if your hand on your chest is moving more, you're probably, probably like many of us who have become less effective in the way that we are breathing. If your hand on your stomach is moving more, that means you've got a great foundation for this deliberate breathing skill that we're going to teach you, and we can continue building on that. Okay? And again, this is going to be something that we have to learn because at some point this is something that we've unlearned. And the more we're able to practice and get awareness of how we are breathing, the better we're going to be able to do this without thinking about it. So let's dive into some practice. Next slide. We're going to take a few minutes and try the skill of deliberate breathing out. So I certainly hope that your colleagues don't believe that you're uh, falling asleep in your cubicle or in your office, um, but you can direct them to this webinar if they don't believe that you are doing a little bit of deliberate breathing practice. Um, the first thing we're going to have you do is just to practice breathing rhythmically. So again, wherever you are in your cubicle, in your office or in the conference room, get into a comfortable position in your chair. Put both feet flat on the floor. Sit up straight so that you can get the full benefits of the relaxation. I'm going to count you off in a five-second cadence. I'm going to start by counting a couple of times just to get the five-second cadence going. And then I will leave you to practice on your own for about three minutes. What I want you to be thinking about as you are going through this practice is paying attention to the physical sensation of your breathing. You want to be paying attention to the air coming in and out of your nose or your mouth. And think about your belly expanding like a balloon and then deflating all the way out. If it helps to count the five-second cadence on your own, by all means do so, and we'll come back in about three minutes. So I will start you off. Inhale. Two, three, four, five. Exhale. Two, three, four, five. Inhale. Two, three, four, five. Exhale. Two, three, four, five. Continue for a couple of minutes and I will ask you to come back. Slowly bring your attention back to the webinar, back to the room. Take a moment and note for yourself any changes that you might have seen happen as a result of that very brief practice of deliberate breathing. Did you notice any changes in your energy? Did you notice any changes in your physiology? Or perhaps in the clarity of your mind? And take note. Take note for yourself of what those changes were. The other thing to take note of is what were some of the struggles you experienced? When I first learned about deliberate breathing, I found myself trying to relax and practice deliberate breathing, and my mind would start to wander to 
my to-do list or the chores that I had to do at home or perhaps thinking about why my belly was expanding as large as it was expanding. Um, so if you're like me and you found it hard to struggle, uh, you found it a struggle to really stay focused on what was going on in your body, that will come with time and practice. You've just learned the sort of baseline application of the deliberate breathing skill. And again, this is like any other learned skill. The more that you practice, the more that your body will automatically engage in deliberate breathing instead of the shallow breathing that you tend to do. And the last piece of this is we know from the research that in addition to breathing rhythmically, which is going to help incite that rest and digest response, one of the ways we can make the skill even more effective, that we can up the ante on the benefits that we're seeing, is by breathing rhythmically and trying to incite a positive emotion in us. One way that we can do that, and one of the skills that we teach as part of our resiliency program, is how the thoughts we have in our mind affect our emotions and reactions, and affect our emotions and our physiology. So one way to up the ante on this is to think about what is a thought I can have that will help generate positive emotions, and specifically the emotion of gratitude or, or some of the more neutral positive emotions like contentment or love can be effective at really helping you incite that rest and digest response. For some of you who aren't word people, um, a couple of other ideas that have come out of other groups we've taught the skill to. Uh, you can think of images that might help you incite that positive emotion. Um, I, like to uh, I like to think about song lyrics that help me feel um, that emotion of gratitude as I do the deliberate breathing practice. That can be really effective as well. So the last question I want to leave you with for this skill is for you all to think about when are the times in my life that I can actually practice deliberate breathing? Because as we said, this is a skill, and if you don't practice, it's not something that's going to enable you to see the full benefits. So when are the times in my life I can set aside for some sustained practice on deliberate breathing? So we get 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, for myself, one of the most useful app applications have been in converting some of the most stressful moments of my day into opportunities to practice deliberate breathing. So for example, I have a four-year-old son. It takes him anywhere between an hour and two hours to fall asleep at night. And it used to be a really stressful time for me just waiting for him to go to bed. And now I take advantage of the, that hour, um, 45 minutes, hour and a half, to really lay down and do some deliberate breathing myself. Um, he's actually caught on to what I'm doing, and he tries to do it, which I've, I've convinced myself enables him to fall asleep a little bit faster. Um, so the, the last part of the skill is really thinking through when are the times in my life that I can practice the skill. Okay? And if you go and learn the skill and practice it and you see some benefits, we would love to hear from all of you um, what, what those benefits are and how it's been helping you in your lives. So feel free to pa pass that feedback on to us at the end of this teleconference. All right, let's move on to the next skill. The next skill is called Hunt the Good Stuff. And for those Army spouses or family members out there, you may have heard your significant others talk about um, or your friends talk about the skill of Hunt the Good Stuff. Um, we're going to talk about the skill very briefly as a foundation for the next skill we're going to introduce. Hunt the Good Stuff is thinking about how we can intentionally put our attention on the positive things in our life. So let me repeat that how we can intentionally put attention on the positive things in our lives. When life circumstances are tough, as we imagine they are for both you as a caregiver and as you as a caregiver watching somebody else go through a really challenging time in their lives, sometimes it can be really difficult for us to see the good in the world. So Hunt the Good Stuff is a really easy skill that can help us intentionally put our intention on the good things that are happening around us. Next slide. Some of the good stuff is work by Martin Seligman and colleagues, um, also by Robert Emmons. So if any of you are interested in learning more about the research on gratitude, um, Robert Emmons has a couple of great books uh, that you can find pretty easily on Amazon. Hunting the good stuff builds positive emotion, optimism, and gratitude. We know that Positive emotions come with it a lot of different benefits. It does that by counteracting the negativity bias. So real quickly, 
the negativity bias is our tendency, it's our human tendency to notice, remember, think about, perhaps process more in detail the things that are going wrong, the negative parts of our lives, than the positive parts. And that way of thinking is adaptive in a lot of ways. Our ancestors had to focus on what, what, what wasn't going well, the threats, the challenges, to be able to ensure that our um, genes got passed on and uh, you know, our species survived. So focusing on the negative can be adaptive. However, if that's the only thing that you're doing, um, you're not seeing the world accurately and you're not getting the benefits that you would be getting from positive emotions. We know that hunting the good stuff, looking for the good in the world, leads to a number of positive outcomes. And I won't get into too much of the research here, but we know that it leads to better health, better sleep and feeling calm. Um, I don't know about all of you, but for me, when I lay in bed as someone who has trouble sleeping, I tend to ruminate about the things that are not going well or the things that I'm worried about. So one of the ways that Hunt the Good Stuff has helped me is by putting my focus on what went well that day, at the end of the day. So that's the last thing I'm thinking about before I go to bed. It also helps with relationships. So when you are looking for the good in other people, when you're asking each other questions that force you both to look at the good that's in life, that can build to stronger relationships. So those are just a couple of examples of some of the benefits of hunting the good stuff. Again, putting your intention to pay attention to what's good in your life. How we teach the way to do this skill is on the next slide. We use a hunt the good stuff journal. So what we ask our soldiers who come to the MRT program to do every day is to record three good things each day in a, in a journal. The critical piece of this activity is next to each positive event, writing a reflection on that good thing. So a couple of the questions they can answer. Why did this good thing happen? What does this thing, good thing mean to you? What can you do to make sure that good thing happens again tomorrow? And who else contributed this, to this good thing happening? So this is one way that we teach our soldiers how to hunt the good stuff. Some alternative ideas we've heard people do, we have dinner conversations that are focused less on how was your day and more on what were the good aspects of the day. You can change the questions that you ask those around you, particularly as caregivers, um, if you're checking in and getting some progress on um, how your wounded warriors are doing throughout the day, instead of saying what's going on or what's happening, perhaps you can say what's good, what's one thing that's good that's going on. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to use this skill and embed it into your life. Um, Comprehensive Soldier and Family Fitness has hashtag Hunt the Good Stuff Thursdays, um, where you can actually go on Twitter or Facebook, uh, write a post and hashtag Hunt the Good Stuff, um, and it's a really fun activity to just become more aware of the good things that other people are noticing and share what you're noticing about your life that's positive um, and, and meaningful. So. This skill I introduced as a very simple skill, and that's going to lead us into talking about the next skill. So the next skill we're going to talk about, next slide, is called active constructive responding. So I'm going to take a risk here and take a moment to talk about love. And when I say love, I don't mean only the kind of love between you and your significant other. I'm talking about deep, meaningful, trusting relationships between you and the people you care about. And for you all as caregivers, those you are caring for and the support networks around both of you. I'm certain that many of you would agree that you can judge the strength of your love by how you answer the question, will you be there for me when things go wrong? You all as caregivers have dedicated your lives to be by the side of someone who's going through a really tough circumstances, to hold their hands in their worst moments providing support and seeing them through their darkest storm of life. What you all do is love, and one of the greatest examples of selfless, selflessness and love that I can think of. And I'm not sure anyone would argue with that. It's easy to see how relationships strengthen as a result of big gestures like that. What we often forget is that love is also in the details. It's knowing exactly what your battle buddy likes from dunks and picking it up on the way to work on Monday morning. It's bringing your neighbor's EPS packages inside when it's pouring rain and picking up the milk at the end of the day when your partner has had a bad day. We often forget that lasting, 
abiding, trusting relationships can be tended to and grown as a result of small gestures. That bees can also forge strong connections using the ordinary stuff that you find in day-to-day -day moments that are all around us. And if we don't look close enough, we could miss out on that opportunity. This skill, called active constructive responding, is a skill that's going to help us leverage those opportunities and build stronger relationships by helping us answer the question, will you be there for me when things go right? We know the answer to this is just as important as the answer to, will you be there for me when things go wrong? And the way we go about being with someone in their moments of joy is going to make all the difference. So let's talk about the skill of ACR. We know that wounded warriors and warriors in transition deal on a day-to-day -day with lots of stressors and challenges. And in turn, you all as the caregivers are also experiencing those stressors and challenges. We also know that there are successes along the way that we could use and leverage to build our relationship with those folks. So some of the good news, some of the positive things that people might be experiencing even in the transition and healing process are, for example, having a good PT um, appointment where they were able to meet their goals. Or perhaps some of your wounded warriors are competing um, in, the, in the warrior games. That's a positive experience that might, they might be sharing with you. And active constructive responding is a style of communication that you can use as people close to those around you when someone shares good news or a positive experience for you. Because we all know that it's easy to get stuck on the struggles and challenges, and in the same way that the negativity bias impacts our ability to notice good, we don't tend to spend the time to elaborate on or savor the things that go well, the little successes and the victories along the way. Next slide. The work on active constructive responding was conducted by Shelley Gable. And what she found was that there are four ways people tend to respond when others share good news or talk about a positive experience. So this is a skill specifically for when someone shares with you some positive news or good news. And relating it back to the skill we just discussed, if they've taken the time to bother to hunt the good stuff, and in addition taken the time to bring that good stuff to you, this is a skill that you can use to help strengthen your relationship. And let me be really specific about what we mean by strengthening relationships. Shelley Gable has found that this active constructive style of responding helps with increasing trust, increasing a sense of belongingness, increasing intimacy, and reducing some of the day-to-day -day hassles that we experience. And these benefits are seen not only for the person who's sharing the good news, but also for the person who is taking the time to respond and be with that person in their moment of joy. So what does this look like? We already talked about in Hunt the Good Stuff on the next slide what we mean by a positive experience. These can be small experiences, um, little things that you noticed. Um, there was a pretty garden that I passed on my way to work. I made it to all my appointments in time. I, the ice cream store had my favorite flavor of ice cream. They can also mean big accomplishments, like making a major, meeting a major milestone in the recovery process or getting a phone call from an old battle buddy. So these are what we mean by the positive experience that others share with us. What does ACR look like? So let's move on to the next slide. When someone has bothered to look for the good in their lives and has bothered to bring that goodness to us, how we respond to them really matters. And here's what Shelley Gable's research really breaks down. I'm going to walk us through each of these styles very quickly and give a little description of what it looks like so that we, uh, we have a good sense of what are some of the other ways that over time, if we don't become aware of how we respond to those around us, how these other response styles can diminish our relationships over time. Let's start with passive constructive. Passive constructive means that when someone brings you good news, you respond with distracted, understated support. So for example, if my husband came home and said, hey, sweetheart, I, got, I just got tickets to the Patriots game, and I am at the kitchen table scrolling on my Facebook, I look up and I say, that's nice, and then I go right back to what I'm doing. That is what we call passive constructive responding. The impact that has on the other person is that they feel like their news wasn't acknowledged. The conversation just dies out. And that's why we've coined this response style, passive constructive responding. 
forgot to mention, as I go through each of these, take note for yourself which one you see yourself in. Which one of these response styles do you give to the people who mean the most around you? And this is going to be a really critical point for you to really think about how to up your game on using those small opportunities to build those relationships around you. The next style is passive destructive. So this is when somebody brings you good news and you just ignore the event or change the conversation to another topic. Um, I also like to think of this one as the one-upper, that when you bring your good news to somebody and they're engaging in passive destructive, that whatever news you're bringing them, they have something better that they want to share with you. So for an example, if my husband comes home and says, hey, sweetie, I just got tickets to the Patriots game, I look at him and I say, that's great. My friend and I are going to go to the Lenny Kravitz concert on, in September. Aren't you excited for me? So that is a good example of passive destructive, where you are hijacking the conversation. You are completely changing the subject from the good news that the other person has brought to you. And as a result, again, the other person feels dismissed, they feel confused, they perhaps um, don't understand why their news wasn't good enough for you to actually ask them some questions. The third style is called active destructive. Active destructive is actively squashing the event or taking a negative focus. So here is when someone brings you good news and all you do is try to poke holes or find what's wrong with the news that they've just shared. And we have coined this style the joy thief. So for example, if my husband comes home and tells me, hey, sweetie, I just got tickets to this Patriots game, and I just start to ask him questions about, well, you know, when is it? Oh, it's in December. Isn't it going to be cold? You know the uh, controversy that's going on right now. Are you sure you want to be a Patriots fan? So here's where someone has bothered to notice something good Someone has bothered to bring you something that is bringing them joy, and you just rain on their parade. You find everything that could possibly go wrong with that good news. We know from Shelley Gable's research that a steady diet of one of these three styles over time is going to severely impact and deteriorate your relationship with that other person. That's just something to keep in mind. And for some of you, you may be looking at one of these three styles and saying, I see myself in that one a lot. And perhaps one of the reasons why you engage in one of those three different styles is for a good, for, with good intention. So for example, I was an active destructive responder for a long time because I felt that the role of a good friend or a good spouse is to help think about those things that perhaps the other person missed to be that person that they can depend on to make sure that um, they've thought through whatever it is that they're doing. I, I didn't realize until learning this um, material that that was over time deteriorating the relationships that were going on in my life. Okay, so just keep some of those things in mind as we go through. The last style, active constructive, there's a gold box around this box because this is the style that we want you to work towards. This is the skill that we are trying to teach you. And what active constructive responding is all about is expressing authentic interest in the other person's good news. Taking a moment, lending yourself to the other person, and being with them in their moment of joy, and helping them elaborate on why that good thing is a good thing. We've coined this joy multiplier. So again, what this looks like is my husband comes home and tells me that he got tickets to the Patriots game, and I stop what I'm doing. I lean in. I make eye contact, and I actually ask him some questions that will help him elaborate on why that's good news. Um, when are you going? Who are you planning on going with you? What would you like me to prepare for the tailgate party? So really taking a minute to, why are you so excited about it? Really taking a moment to sit down and be with somebody in their moment of joy. That's why we call this style the joy multiplier. Now, some of you have been probably following along with this webinar thinking, you know, there are a lot of reasons why I don't do this. Perhaps it's I don't have to show interest because the people who, care, who I care most about know, I, know that I love them, and there's no reason to engage in this. Again, think of all the big gestures, big effort that you put towards strengthening the relationships that you have in your lives. Active constructive responding is a really easy tool to put money in that relationship bank. 
It doesn't take a lot of effort. It's just perhaps asking one or two more questions to help somebody really elaborate on their joy, really savor the good things that are going on in their lives. I'm not going to go into this next slide um, much into detail for the sake of time. Some of you might be feeling a little resistant to engaging somebody or being with someone in their moment of joy. And I think acknowledging that the, the folks in your lives um, who are most important to you probably feel really comfortable sitting down and talking through things that are going wrong or challenges that you're experiencing with those folks much more than you do elaborating on and taking the time to process the positive experiences that you have. And one of the reasons or some of the hurdles that people encounter with this skill is that they um, have beliefs about themselves that prevent them from really being with someone. So I won't go through these frequently asked questions all the time. One way to think about the information on this slide is here are some of the things we tend to tell ourselves when we don't want to be with someone in their moment of joy. For example, I might tell myself, I don't really care about football. I don't really care about the news that this person is bringing me, so I'm not going to leverage this opportunity to be with someone in their moment of joy. Important thing to remember is it's not about the news itself. It's about your genuine, authentic interest in the person who's bringing that news to you. That if you care about that person and you care about strengthening the relationship between you and that person, that you'll find a way to ask some different questions or engage them to leverage that opportunity. Um, I'm happy to talk more offline about some of these other questions, but for you all, it's important to think about what gets in your way. What are the things that stop you from lending yourself to somebody when they bring you the good things that they notice in their lives? And again, just to reiterate, how you respond and whether you are with someone both in their moments of pain and suffering and struggle, just as important to be with those people in their moments of joy, to celebrate, to help them elaborate on some of the positive experiences, particularly as you are in the role of caregiver, um, that can help really strengthen the relationship, which we know the strength of that relationship dictates many um, whether or not the wounded warriors are able to achieve some of their positive outcomes. So that is the scale of active constructive responding. Again, we are happy to talk offline, or if you have any questions about the skills, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, in your handout panel, there is a CSF2 skills overview sheet the one that you see on the next slide, slide 21. I've introduced a couple of the skills that we teach as part of our Comprehensive Soldier and Family Fitness Program. If you find that there are any other skills that you would feel are useful um, or you'd like to learn more about, please feel free to reach out to us and we can try to arrange some training or get that information out to you um, so that we can learn more about your needs as well. Finally, if you are an Army spouse or family member or active duty yourself, here are where our training center locations are. If you are close to one of these training centers, feel free to reach out to the folks there. You can contact somebody at CSF2 and they can give you the contact information for an MRTP or a training center manager who can put you in touch with additional resources that we may be able to provide you. Next slide. Finally, here's my contact information. Thank you all for joining us today, and we want to extend our gratitude um, for being able to share some of what we teach and what we're passionate about sharing with our community uh, with all of you today. Um, thank you all for the important work that you all do, and if you have any suggestions on how we can improve our training to make it more impactful for you, please pass that along through uh, Military One Source or Warrior Care Command, and we'll be happy to address it um, when we have an opportunity to. All right, thank you. We do have a couple of questions that um, have come in. Um, first question reads, how does the skill of deliberate breathing differ from recovery to use, to use during performances? Okay, so um, there are two different applications of deliberate breathing that we teach. The recovery application, which I've spent a lot of time talking about today, has to do with um, doing some prolonged practice. So 15 to 20 minute sessions of engaging in deliberate breathing to really help you recharge your energy stores. 
the performance application, which I didn't talk much about today, is taking two or three deliberate breaths before you go to do a particular task to help you get you grounded and focused on what you need to do in that present moment. So one is there's a couple of differences. The key difference is the length of practice required for each. And then the other difference is the setting in which you're using it. So the recovery application has to do with storing energy. The performance application has to do with using deliberate breathing to get you set up um, for a particular task. Okay, great. Uh, next question. I feel dizzy after practicing rhythmic breathing. Mm -hmm. Is this normal? Can you explain why this occurred? Yeah, um, I I can only speak from personal experience. Um, for for many of us, if you're not used to diaphragmatic breathing, you're probably taking in a lot more oxygen than you're used to getting with a regular breath. I know for me, um, when I first learned about deliberate breathing and started practicing it for long periods of time, I would get um, spasms in my eyelids. I know that's strange to, to discuss, but for, for different people, I think the change or the shift that you're making um, and inciting that rest and digest response can bring on a couple of different things. And one might be um, that you are bringing in more oxygen. Uh, you might have to change up the cadence at which you're practicing deliberate breathing. Um, so it's something that you can play around with. But some of the physical, you know, there's, there's a lot of different physical responses that come with people who are learning deliberate breathing for the first time. Okay, let's see. Um, are certain ineffective styles of responding more common in certain settings, i.e. work versus home? Um, I'm going to try to interpret what that question is about. Um, I know that oftentimes when we teach active constructive responding to soldiers in our MRT courses, a common question we get is, A, um, you know, what if I need to maintain professional boundaries at work and I don't want to ask questions um, or strengthen that relationship? And also, um, are, you know, who is the style of responding appropriate with? So, for example, uh, one of the questions we often get is, if there's someone who's sharing with me constantly about good news that's going on and I just don't have the time, um, and if this is a professional setting, do I need to engage them? Um, we have a lot of discussion around this topic at the Level 1 trainings, at the Level 1 MRT trainings. The short answer is I don't know um, whether there's a style that's more common. I believe that there's probably a pattern in the way that we think about the way that we respond to people, uh, some of the core beliefs and values you might have about maintaining professionalism or maintaining boundaries that often get in the way of responding to people um, in certain settings. Okay, great. Um, let's see, thank you for this. Uh, it was great. I like the response to, uh, styles piece. My question is, what role do you see deliberate breathing having with treating MST survivors? Um, I'm not sure what MST stands for. Um, to the attendee who um, submitted that question, do you mind um, breaking up the letters of MST and spelling it out, please? Thank you. Military sexual trauma. Hmm. So, and what was the question again? Could you repeat the question? Uh, yes. Um, what role do you see deliberate breathing having with treating military sexual trauma survivors? So I um, don't have a way of connecting the two directly. Um, I don't know much about the MST population. Um, we could probably venture to guess that um, folks who have dealt with military, military sexual trauma perhaps are having trouble sleeping, um, having trouble um, with their energy stores and, and being able to recover and deal with what they've been through effectively. Um, one application that I can see is perhaps in the, the preventing or helping with insomnia um, that they might be experiencing. Um, I can look into uh, whether there are more, more connections or applications of deliberate breathing with that population and get back to that person if they'd like to leave their contact information. Okay, great. Um, at this time, there are no 
further questions that have come in. Um, let's see. The person responded, check the documentary, The Invisible War. Document Documentary, The Invisible War. Mm-hmm. I guess that's uh, um, something that she's referring to. Okay. Or he's referring to. Okay. The okay. Invisible War. Great. Um, and just for you all, my contact information, my email and phone number are there. Uh, feel, feel free to reach, out to reach out to me with any additional questions you might have on both the content and the kind of training that we can provide. I'm more than happy to um, have some more conversation around uh, these topics. And um, also, um, our attendees can always um, email moswebinars at militaryonesource.com uh, if they have any questions after the webinar is over, and I can get those over to the presenter as well. Um, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Gloria Park for sharing her invaluable experience and expertise. I would also like to thank our attendees for participating in today's webinar. And if there are no further questions coming in, um, this will conclude today's webinar on Ready and Resilient, Training Skills to Enhance the Personal Readiness of Wounded Warriors, Their Caregivers, and Family Members. Thank you all for attending, and thank our presenters for their performance today. Thank you. Thank you for having us.